welcome everyone to our new user workshop. This is Jessica Frank with the Center for Access to Justice and Technology at Chicago Kent. And today we are going to be talking about A to J Author 5.0, the basics. We will have time at the end for any questions as well. So on our agenda today, we have creating a new question in A to J Author 5.0, the question design window, where did all those tabs go? The question design window um, scroll to see it all. And then we'll talk a little bit about additional resources that we are planning and have in place right now. The first step is to register and log into your um, a to j author.org account. This is the new a to j author website. For those of you that weren't here with us last Friday for our webinar, we have transitioned uh, a to j author.org to this new site. If you still want to access the resources on the old site, you can go to old.a2jauthor.org. Again, that's old.a2jauthor.org. The two websites have different logins. So if you had a registration on the old site, you need to create a registration anew on this site. Once you register, you'll get an email explaining that you um, need to be activated once I activate you. You'll get another email that says you've been activated. Here's, your, here's how to sign in and uh, create a password. And it'll also include a link to a survey. So before we can authenticate you as an A to J Author 5.0 user, we need you to fill out this survey that has a little bit of information. Where do you work? What projects are you working on? Have you worked on A to J guided interviews in the past? It's super short Google form. And then once I get that from you, I can activate your account as an A to J author, and you'll have access to the new authoring tool. So once you're logged in, you're, you go through that whole registration, activation, and authentication process, you can log in and start using A to J author 5.0 by clicking the author tab, which you can see here is along the top navigation bar. The icon for authoring on the new website is basically a piece of paper and a pencil. We also, as you can see, have the home screen, Learn, which will give you um, more resources like our authoring guide and uh, options for that. Groups, we'll, we're breaking you out into 4.0 authors, 5.0 authors, A to J clinic students, so it's a little bit of customized stuff for specific groups that access our website. And there's always the help button as well. So when you open an A to J guided interview, here I've gone and clicked that paper and pencil, that author, and I've opened up a blank interview on my interviews tab. The blank uh, default guided interview comes preloaded with four questions. That's the same as it was in 4.0. If you want to add more, you can click the new button, which is circled at the bottom, or you can click the clone button, which is next to it. If you click clone, it will do what it says, clone whatever question is highlighted. If you click new, it will continue to add new blank um, text pages under step zero. So you can clone questions in other steps but you can only create new questions and they show up in step zero. And this is on the pages tab, which is a new tab along the left. That's where you can see all of your pages and pop-ups, um, basically all of your questions. It's similar to what was next to the flow chart in 4.0, but it has a little bit more detail. Just a reminder, questions appear in the interview by how they are connected to each other in the map. They don't necessarily go in the same order um, as they're listed on this pages section. A reminder to you if you're a new author or if you're an experienced author, make sure to um, organize your questions alphanumerically. So they, they're automatically organized alphanumerically. So you're going to want to start with a number and then the name of the question um, so that you can see what order they're going in. And that is how the default questions come, if you forget, in A to J4, uh, in A to J5. So when you double click on a question or you click the edit button at the bottom of the page, the question design window opens up as a pop-up. In 4.0, there were tabs in the question design window. Now you just scroll down. So before you had the question tab, the fields tab, the buttons tab, and the logic tab, here we have page information, question text, fields, buttons, and logic. And we'll go through each one of those sections. But it's scrolling now instead of clicking through each um, tab individually. The first section is the page information. So page information lets you edit the step, so you can change what step your question is in. You can edit the name of your question, 
And you can add design notes for this question. So as in 4.0, where design notes was at the bottom of the question, the first question tab, it's now up under page information. So here would be, um, I'm asking this question because statute 1234 requires this. You can leave notes for yourself, and you can leave notes for those who tackle your interview in the future. You can also, if you look a little bit further down, see the question text where you can type in um, the actual text of your question, and you can add audio to your text, uh, the same as in 4.0. And instead of that little yellow folder where you would click audio to upload, you just click the upload button and a folder will pop up as well where you can select the audio that you want to use. We look a little bit closer at the question text. Once you click into that text box, so if we go back real quick to this last slide, you can see here that it's just the text box, nothing on top of it. If I clicked into this area, it changes into um, basically extra editing tools that you can use in 5.0. So you can embolden the text, italicize it, add a hyperlink to external websites, and add pop-ups as well. Remember, you cannot change the font type, the font color, or the font size. We're looking for uniformity in how A to J author guided interviews are presented to end users, but you can customize it a little with emboldening, italicizing, and adding those pop-ups or hyperlinks. If we keep scrolling down, so here was the question text again in that text audio. If you scroll a little bit further, you get to the learn more prompt and the learn more answer. So learn more prompt is the same as the learn more question. That the, that's what the end user thinks. It's that little thought bubble that pops up to the side when a question is displayed. The learn more answer is called help. So that is the answer or the help that the guide avatar provides to the end user. Your learn more answer can be text. It can be show me graphic or show me video. And LHI has recently increased their file upload size, so you can include more graphics and potentially videos, depending on the size of your file, with 5.0. We're still working with them on how you're going to exactly upload your 5.0 interviews, but it is something to think about that you can start adding in additional graphics or videos to your guided interview. Under the help section, you can add in audio as well, so your guide avatar can reply to the end user um, with an audio clip. If you double clicked or if you clicked into the prompt or the help section, again those same emboldening, italicized, pop-up and hyperlink options that came up when you clicked into the text box would display here um, as well for you to use. And then finally, if you look under the second upload button at the bottom, here we have the counting variable. This is where you can designate your repeat loop variable. Those of you that are new to authoring completely, um, don't worry about repeat loops right now. We'll go into subsequent trainings in 5.0, how to do repeat loops, but there are trainings about how to do repeat loops in 4.0, if you want to watch those on our YouTube channel. But just a note here, this is where you designate that this question is part of a repeat loop. So scrolling down again brings us to the fields section. Here, by default, the field section is blank. You can see that there's nothing there. Um, if, if I clicked, it clicked this number and changed it from zero to even one, it would open up this new box, and then I would be able to edit all the different field sections. Adding a field gives you the option then of uh, changing the type of field, changing the label, that's what's shown to the end user in front of where they select their answer. You can assign a variable and a default value. You can designate whether it's required or not. You can include a prompt for required questions, so if invalid, that is they leave it blank, what prompt do you want to say? In A to J Author 4.0, a prompt, a sample prompt was given to you and you could edit it. Here, you have to add in the prompt yourself for what you want it to say. And at the very bottom, we have a new thing called sample value. Sample value allows those of you who test your A to J guide interviews regularly to fill in basically a sample value for what it would be. So instead of having when you're previewing and testing, having to type in an answer every time, you can preload a sample value into your field. And when you're in the preview button, in the preview um, screen testing, you can click fill and it, the A to J author will preload all of those sample values so that you can quickly click through to a specific section that you want to type. So instead of having to type in Jane Doe, um, Jane and Doe, you know, with a middle name and gender female and her address is 1234 Main Street in Chicago, Illinois, 60661, typing in all that over and over when I'm really just trying to test whether this repeat loop works, I can put a sample value here 
say this was a field for first name, I can put Jane in. And every time I want to just quickly test this, I can have A to J fill in that sample value. So that's a new um, quick trick for those of you that have kind of long interviews and you just want to test specific sections to see if they're working. This will help you speed through that testing process. Just a note for new, any newbies that are on here. You don't always have to use the fields tab. That's why by default it comes with no fields shown. You can just use buttons to move through questions and to gather information from your end user. Buttons, however, only allow you to gather three pieces of information, or only allow you to get three options to your end user. Fields let your end user provide you with an answer. So they can type in something like their name, their address, text, anything like that phone number, it allows you to collect data from the end user that they have to type in rather than just selecting an option. If we go over the field section a little bit closer, label is what appears before the field in the question text. So you might say what is your birth date and then the label could say birth date next to it. Just to clarify if you were asking for multiple pieces of information in one question or what is your address, and then over the first line it could say the label could be street, then um, city, then state, then zip code. For assigning default values, this allows you to auto fill in the state or county um, if the end user leaves it blank. So if you know that everybody is going to be using your form in Cook County, you can use that as a default value, and if they leave it blank, Cook County will by default fill in. You can limit value ranges for numbers. So for example, for date of birth, um, you can limit what is shown from say 1914 to 2014 so that you have, you don't think anybody over 100 years old is going to be using our form. Then the, the maximum value is 1914. The minimum year shown then is 2014 and that will limit anyone from typing in um, or using the calendar to select a date in the future. If you don't want to go in every year and have to edit that minimum value, you can change it to the word today and A to J author will always make today's date the latest date that anyone can pick. So you won't be able to pick any dates in the future and you won't have to go in and update it all the time. You can show a calendar for dates. The calendar allows your end user to select, say they knew it was the first Tuesday in March of this year, but they don't know what date that is. So they can go to the calendar and look and see what was the actual date of the first Tuesday in March and select that as well. You can include internal and external lists. So internal lists are the same as in 4.0 where you could just type in the list. External lists are, are just XML lists that you upload. For example, a list of all the states, which is on our old um, A to J author website, old A to J author.org, in the sample kit, um, and will be on our 5.0 website soon. External lists can also be counties, um, and basically anything X, an XML list can be uploaded and included here. And then finally, you can require your end user to fill in an answer, so they won't be able to move on until they fill it in, or you can leave that box unchecked, and then they can move through the question without answering it. So what are fields? Fields are the format of the answer an end user provides. There are six basic types, text, number, date, gender, radio buttons, and check boxes. Here, for example, I've highlighted the date. If I selected date as the type, it would then, for the end user, which is the second screenshot to the right, please enter your birth date, and then I selected that a calendar should be allowed, and they would be able to type in their birth date in month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. Field types and variable types are not the same. Variable types determine how the data should be treated. Field types are just the format of the answer. So for example, a phone number is a field type number. Here you can see number phone is the fourth number option. But it is a variable type text because you're not going to do any computations with it. So in hot docs, your variable would be set as a text variable. And also in A to J author 5, it would be set, even though the field type is number. So just remember, they don't have to match field type and variable type. On our last scroll through, we get to the buttons and the logic and the logic section. So here at the top, you can add and delete buttons. You can also add buttons by um, changing this number in the drop down list from to one, two, or three. You need at least one button, the continue button, so that people can move on. But um, other than that, you don't have to have any other buttons. You can assign a variable of value by including the variable name and whatever default value it is. So the question can be, are you married? The label says yes. 
that's the button label, so that's what the end user selects. The variable name is Mary True False. And the default value I want to assign to that when the end user clicks yes is true. So under default value, I would put true. The destination question looks a little bit different than it did in 4.0. Instead of having a little yellow folder, which would pop out a list of um, all of the questions you can choose from, you click this blue button and that same list pops up. So it gives you all of the options that um, you can select from, which I'll show you in a minute in a couple screens. It also gives you the A to J default options as well. And then finally, under the button section, we have the repeat options. So again, this is for repeat loops. It's normal set counting variable to one or increment counting variable. And you designate the counting variable as well. Getting to know our buttons a little bit more, and here you can see our new avatars. If, if you haven't seen them, this is an example of two of them when the ladies repeated twice. New questions by default only have that continue button. You use buttons instead of fields for questions with three options or less or when you don't have to gather a typed in response. The maximum number of buttons is three, but you can label them however you'd like. So do you have children? Yes, no, or we're pregnant. It doesn't have to just be a one letter thing. It can be a little bit longer. There is a size restriction on buttons. It starts to look weird if you had like a really long option it um, throws off the spacing of the buttons, so it's something to keep track of. I'm not sure of the exact character count, but there, you do hit a point when the button label is too long um, for, for the space allowed for the buttons. So what can a button do? A button can assign a value to a variable, which we talked about, so that would be like Mary, true, false, and um, it's assigning true when the user clicks yes. You can go to another question, so you can branch with the continue. You can sequ sequentially move on, or you can, if, they answer yes that they have children, then you can move them on to questions about their children. If they select no, then you can move them out of children questions, don't even ask it to them, move on to another section of your interview. And you can set or increment a counting variable, which is for repeat loops. Here is what I mean when you click the destination button, the pop-up that used to be in the little yellow folder pops up and now you can pick a destination page. You can select from other questions you've created. You can go back to prior question, which will be under special branching at the bottom. You can select success process form. That's the one you use only once in any given interview. That's what moves the end user out of the A to J guide interview and either into your um, online intake system or onto LHI to process the form. And then the exiting. So exit user doesn't qualify, pops up a website URL that um, you can redirect your end user to. There's a couple different exiting functions. This is all done on the destination question section of the buttons. Finally, we have the advanced logic section. You'll notice it is way pared, uh, pared down from 4.0. Here, you're just going to be writing if-else statements. So it's here at the bottom, this advanced logic. And you can tell A to J author to evaluate those if-else statements either before the end user presses the button or after, and you just type, start typing in, if, else, go to, all those fun logic things that, are, that you're used to doing in Hot Docs, you can do a lot of those here in A to J Author as well. If you're a new user and this section scares you, don't worry, we'll be doing trainings on um, exactly how to write those if, else statements um, in the future, and those will be recorded and put on our website. Um, and it will also be a section in our 5.0 authoring guide as well. And then my final um, slide is the All Logic tab. Here, all of your logic can be seen in one place. You can easily edit all of the logic and all the advanced conditions running behind the scenes instead of opening up each question and having to edit the logic that way. Here you can see a couple examples of those if-else statements. So if income is uh, greater than 35,000, set the variable income too high TF, true, false, to true, and also take them to the question that probably says, sorry, you don't qualify. Else, if it's not uh, greater than 35,000, set that same variable to false. And if it, they're between um, the second part of this first if-else statement is if their income is between 35,000 and 25,000, go to a subsequent question that I'm sure would ask them about any um, deductions or any ways to reduce their income, any expenses, that kind of thing. And the end if. So they're, they're fairly simple if-else statements. 
um, and once you start working with it, you'll you'll get used to it. And I'm sure those of you that are advanced authors on here are happy to see this as well. You don't have to click all those buttons and um, create advanced conditions like you did in 4.0. It's much cleaner and a little bit more like programming here. Um, our Ada J Author 5.0 authoring guide is a work in progress. It is 300 pages, so we are going through and um, updating the screenshots, walking through um, everything we discussed today, and it will be updated and put onto our adajauthor.org website when it is available, hopefully shortly. We also have our recorded trainings and presentations on our YouTube channel, and those will be updated as well as we're going along. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you, or you can put those questions in the question box and I can answer them as well. If you have questions in the future, feel free to email me, jbolak at kentlaw.edu, um, or call, which is my phone number here. Um, the question is, can you now edit links? In 4.0, you had to delete them as they could not be edited. Um, not sure what you mean by links, so I'm going to unmute you, Steve, if you could explain that one. You're unmuted. Okay. Um, yeah, when you uh, uh, enter a link to a website mm -hmm. in a, a help file, you could not, uh, if you did a typo and came back later, you could not edit the link. It, it, it continued to replace itself with the former version. So I was wondering if you edited that and so you can actually now edit the links or do you have to, I had to delete them and, then, and put new ones in. That's weird. I didn't know that it was doing that. Um, I'll test for it and then if it um, is working, is not working, like um, you suggested, like it's you had to delete them and redo it rather than editing, I'll add that into our issue tracker um, okay. for our program. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't know that it was doing that. Um, just wondering whether we need to recreate our existing interviews or is there a conversion process? There is a conversion process. Right here at the bottom, you can upload your A to J guided, your 4.0 guided interviews into 5.0 and um, edit them as well. So the, the conversion process, they, they absolutely, absolutely do need to be converted. Um, if you want to take all of the benefits of 5.0 um, for your 4.0 interviews, but it's a pretty simple upload process and then you just have to test your interview. So some of the uploaded interviews, I want to make sure that all of the logic that was in five, in 4.0 is working. If it wasn't working, these boxes would be red. Here's where you would need to do um, some of the focus if you had some breaks. I created an FAQ if we go back to our home page. Here is the frequently asked questions section. And we had a couple pretty common error messages that were popping up from 4.0 to 5.0 conversions. So if you click on this first um, question, I went through and I created an answer that has eight different common um, reasons why your interview might break. So sometimes it's little things like um, you use the word or, someone typed in or, or twice, or you forgot to close a parentheses, or you forgot to close um, a bracket or quotes, something like that, and those are quick little fixes. So I've included in this FAQ eight problems and then the solution for solving them. On that note, with 4.0 to 5.0, we have noticed that sometimes they won't upload. So I created an FAQ for that. So what do you do if your 4.0 interview won't upload? And by won't upload, I mean that you are trying to upload it and it keeps just showing a blank. Like it'll say my interview blank. Um, I might have an example in five here. So it pops up untitled uploaded guide. Well, that doesn't, like those are ones that I had issues with uploading. So what do you do if you can't upload? So it turns out that some 4.0 interviews were saved in um, kind of odd file structures um, and it had weird encoding like Windows 1252 um, or something that isn't UTF-8. UTF-8 encoding is needed to properly upload A to J4 interviews into 5.0. So I included an FAQ about how to convert your whatever encoding you had to UTF-8. Um, you just download an open edit pad Lite, which is a free text editor that um, John Mayer, the head of our tech team, recommended. You open your interview, you click convert, you encode it to UTF-8, you click OK, you save it with a different name, you upload it, and you refresh your browser. 
and it works. So um, if you are having problems with uploading, feel free to email us and let us know if it's not included in our FAQ. But check those FAQs, um, that section, because they are being updated daily. Another question, is there a way for multiple people to work on the same project using their individual accounts? We're working on that right now. While we were troubleshooting uh, an issue yesterday, we came up with the idea of like, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could just, instead of emailing files back and forth, if we could just log in and see, like you could share your um, guided interview with, with us. Um, and therefore also be able to share it with other people. We're working on the back end. Right now, there is not a way for multiple people to work on the same project in their own individual accounts. You would have to download the file and then upload it into the next person's and share it the same way as if you were working um, in 4.0. But we are working on that behind the scenes of allowing you to be able to share interviews um, between individual accounts. Um, another question about mobile, the new mobile access features for end users. So our mobile viewer is still a work in progress. It's turning out to be a lot snarlier um, than we first thought. That's clearly a technical term. Um, but we are currently working on the mobile um, access, the mobile viewer for end users. So we don't really have anything to show on that beyond kind of our tech demos that we've done earlier um, in the year which are on our YouTube channel, but nothing new to report there. But keep an ear out. We're working on that one as well. Another question, how long do you have to complete the conversions? So we are currently estimating that these will take six months to a year. Um, we understand that you guys are busy, and we are working with LHI for um, how much time they will support 4.0 and 5.0 interviews at the same time, and how long they'll continue to keep that 4.0 viewer open. We here at Ada J Author, um, will continue to support 4.0 for the next at least year to two. Um, so you will have time to work on these conversions as well. Uh, question, the interviews will work in the mobile browser, won't they? Um, by that I assume you mean 5.0 interviews. So to to take advantage of the four of to take advantage of the mobile browser, you're going to have to upload and convert your 4.0 interviews into 5.0 interviews. But the mobile browser will work with five, any 5.0 interview. Basically, how we're creating the browser is that it will, when an end user accesses an A to J guided interview, their device will tell um, the server which viewer to use. So it'll say it'll tell what screen size it's using. Basically, um, it's not a, it's not an app that people download. It's all going to be a, a mobile browser, or a, a, it'll be accessible via the browser. So the browser will tell Ada, or tell the server what size it is, um, either a, a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone. And then A to J will, um, the server will select the appropriate A to J viewer to use for that. So yes, your 5.0 interviews that you create now and you start working on now will work with, your, with the mobile browser when it comes out, hopefully um, in the fall. Will, uh, last, or another question, will the 5.0 interviews work with HTML5? Well, they are written in um, jQuery HTML5, so yes, they will work with HTML5. And they work currently, for those of you that are dealing with um, thinking ahead for your end users and the browsers that they um, access this on, currently our um, browsers we know that work with 5.0 are all HTML5 browsers, so Chrome, Firefox, IE10 or higher, I think they're on IE11 now. Um, IE8 and IE9, we've had, we've done some limited testing and um, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot on that one. Um, and we know that you're working sometimes with Quartz or um, your own computers that have sl slower, older browsers. Um, and we're hoping this is an incentive to upgrade. But um, for the meantime, Chrome does work on machines that would be running IE8 or IE9, and um, our interviews run in Chrome. Oh, Carol, okay, I will unmute you, because I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Hi, Jessica. What I was trying to ask about in terms of a mobile browser was, I, I, on my ta on an Android tablet I have, I look, went to one, a couple of the sample interviews that you guys have up, and it seemed to work just fine. So even though it doesn't really, uh, 
frame for the device, um, it looks to me like you can go ahead and access them um, on, a, on a tablet or a smartphone, um, even though it may not fit on the, on the mobile device screen correctly yet. Yeah, so um, because it's a website, you can basically access it on any device that has a modern browser, but it is that sizing issue that's the problem. So our mobile viewer um, is going to have be a lot more pared down and it's, it's going to be optimized for it. So just like um, if you're on like any any website, you can select between the mobile version of the website or the full version of the website. You kind of just have to like expand and scroll a lot if you're on the full version. Um, right. You can do that with our current, with the, the current version, with our regular viewer, um, but the mobile viewer will be optimized for those smaller screens. So it'll break questions up, that kind of thing. Thanks. No problem. We're still, this is all still a work in progress. So anything you guys notice, please let us know. Um, we've been testing it for months, and sometimes when you look at the same thing over and over again, you miss little things. So um, can you copy and paste? Yes, you can in the um, question pages. If I just want to copy the question text itself, you can just use control C, control V um, to copy, and then I could paste it into a different question. Yeah, you can copy and paste. Um, copy and paste, and you can clone questions as well. So you can have multiple questions open, but um, you can copy and paste as well from question to question or from switch between interviews, open up another interview, copy and paste that into it as well. Between different interviews, yeah, you could have, um, you can't wholesale copy and paste right now, but we're working on ways to, to take sections of the interviews and allow you to import those into um, other interviews. So if you had somebody, who, like a sample interview that you really love this advanced logic and this really complicated branching that somebody had done in, in New York or something like that and you wanted to use it in your, cor in, in your form, um, we're working on ways where you could copy that wholesale and then change the answer um, but, or change the variables. But right now you can copy and paste just like you could in a Word document but not the whole question itself between different interviews. I'm not seeing any, but feel free, like I mentioned, to email me at any time. Um, we love hearing from you, and I, um, like I said, you guys are testing it. You use this way more than any of us here even use Data J Author. And um, if you see something, like let us know, and I'll add that into our issue tracker with our programmer, um, so that he can start adding that in and fixing it. All right. Thank you all for coming today. Okay, welcome.